welcome to HD Talk Show, The Interview. Continuing our COVID focus series, we have with us Dr. Naresh Trehan, well known cardiologist, who will talk to us about what heart patients need to do if COVID strikes. Welcome to the show, Dr. Trehan, and thank you for being with us. Dr. Trehan, you are a storyteller, and I mean it nicely. So in the course of this conversation, while we talk of the risks of a heart patient, if he has COVID, etc., do tell us some interesting experiences. But first things first, how great is the risk for a heart patient if he is struck with COVID? So we have seen in our experience from the last wave continuing and getting worse in this second wave, that we are seeing that at least 15 to 20 percent of the patients are getting affected by the virus in their heart. So if you take the full spectrum, for one is the fact that people who have pre-existing heart disease, like they may have had heart attacks or they may have had stents put in or they may have had bypass, like those people are obviously coming back to us with enhanced symptoms, we have seen acute heart attacks. Even in patients who do not have a pre-existing history, they suddenly get a heart attack and crash. So this has been the experience in, in not the sort of across the board of heart patients, but most of them will come with chest pain. Most of them we can rescue, but the ones that get the virus to a level where their heart function goes down to 10, 15, 20 percent, those are the ones who, who get into severe danger. So what have we seen this time as opposed to last time? That this time, younger people are getting more affected, those people who have no history of heart disease. We have seen many, many patients being referred to us from peripheral centers, from other hospitals, who suddenly find the patients, the young guy, people are doing well, and suddenly they crash and then they when they do the echocardiography we find that they have got a, a ejection fraction which is measurement of the pumping of the heart to 15 20 percent and they go into pulmonary edema that means that blood backs up into their lungs and they are in very serious trouble now at least 70 percent of those people who get into this acute stage of myocarditis they will not make it. So we are saying that two things from this you deduce. That this viral wave is different from the first one, where we found that very few young people below the age of 50 got affected. Only the ones who did have pre-existing heart disease were the ones who got affected by this fact that their heart function became a little weaker, they got some chest pain, and some of them got heart attacks. But this is a new group where they do not have any pre-existing heart disease. They are young, as low as 23 years of age. So we, by the time we find that they are referred to us, it kind of becomes too late. Now, the only situation where we, there has been a difference made is if the patients are in your hospital or nearby your hospital and are referred at the right time, that you can put what we call use the uh, ECMO is a machine which is extracorporeal oxygen mem uh, membrane oxygenator which will take over the oxygenation and the heart function for you depending on the severity of the problem and you can support them for prolonged periods of time a week two weeks and sometimes or at least 20 30 percent of the time they will recover that the caution that the young people have to to exercise is the same as they had the, as the adults and the vulnerable have been doing throughout the year. Dr. Trihan, what role does panic have to play in this? Because people, as you said, and we've seen also with no heart disease, suddenly die of a cardiac arrest. So those who do not have heart disease, do you think panic leads to it? You know, I, I don't think so. I, I think that, look, there is a differentiation between panic and anxiety. Panic to me means that you've lost your balance. 
and you are kind of running around without any any direction. That's panic. Anxiety is that you are worried about yourself, and you are worried about your family and whatever uh, it, your surroundings are. But anxiety does play a very significant role in this journey of the COVID infection. We always tell people that look, you must use de-stressing techniques. And the best technique is the pranayama of yoga. What does anxiety do? Anxiety also what it does is it releases adrenaline. When you are scared or, or you are, like you said, even panicking, your adrenaline level goes up. That means your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up. And that's not a right, the right thing to happen in the middle of this COVID infection that an individual will have. So it's important that all of us, all of us practice this anyway, even if you've got the disease or not, because the panic is there or the anxiety is there. Even us healthcare professionals who are exposed to it on a daily basis, even we have that fear, even we have that anxiety. So we, across the board, now is the time to do three things. One, you must exercise to keep your immunity up. You must do de-stressing techniques on a daily basis, no matter whether you have been infected or not. And the third thing is your nutrition should be healthy, at least 30 to 40 grams of protein a day. You know, you spoke about panic, you spoke about anxiety. Is worry synonymous with anxiety or is it a different area altogether? No, they are basically they merge into each other. Worry is mental only. Anxiety is the next step which actually affects your whole body because it, it actually triggers your hormonal system. And that, like I said, it, if, it, if it leads to the adrenaline release or noradrenaline release, it actually affects your whole body. Your blood pressure will go up and you will have uh, other symptoms associated with that. Whereas worry can be depressing more. And this anxiety is an addition to that worry. And the last step is panic, because then you lose your, your sense. What for a heart patient are or should be the warning signs? When should alarm bells ring? So I'll tell you, the important thing is, when you know your pre-existing history, and your doctor knows your pre-existing history, the doctor will adjust your medicines according to that. And two things that are important in this situation. Supposing you're getting some symptoms, supposing you're getting heaviness in the chest. And if you're, the, the main thing to do is one, consult your doctor if you can, because you already are attached to a doctor. And you can, your pulse rate and your oxygenation, you can measure yourself. If it is showing any signs and the doctor advises you to take, we can give you sorbitrate under the tongue and I don't want anybody to pre medicate themselves because that's why I would not even give the details any further. But appropriate medicines can be given for somebody who is experiencing some symptoms, especially if we know that they have pre-existing heart disease. So that is the, as the event that you do not want to take lightly you must be in touch with your doctor. And my advice is that, you know, a lot of people, what they are doing today are, if your neighbor or your or your brother or your father had a prescription, you say, I also got it, let me copy the same prescription. That's not the right thing to do because it has to be individualized. And in that individualization, you have to take into consideration all the other parameters. The other thing that we have added, which has been very, very helpful, is that we have what we care, what we call live core. Live core is a device. It's the size of, uh, say, a matchbox. It's much thinner. You can use that uh, to transmit your cardiogram to our command center at Medanta so that we can real time check the cardiogram of a person 
who may be feeling the symptoms or who if he's a heart patient can get it checked twice a day regularly anyway so this is life core is a new device which we are giving our patients who we believe may be at risk for heart problems otherwise also but especially in this covid time uh, dr trehan you spoke about copying prescriptions now in the case of covid there are lots of prescriptions going around and everyone says it's the same medication is it advisable to go with that whether it's a heart patient or a normal patient or should one in every covid case consult a physician i would insist that every individual case should consult individually this whole thing of convenience that you know i'm the same age i'm this uh it's similar profile so i can use the same medicines can actually come to bite you so it's not advisable that you to pay, copy paste somebody else's prescription onto yourself because there are some fine things we need to consider and and those things are not measurable by everybody so a trained physician and now most physicians have been trained to at least understand the basics and if there is more complication than just basics then the specialized people are also available you know some of the medicines that we use like steroids will bump up your uh, your uh, sugar very high you know there are some some medicines which will affect your kidney so we need to be very careful about the full history of a person and then prescribe the medications that it should be on Dr. Trian, actually, the problem is non-availability of doctors. And from what you say, I understand that doctors and physicians are available. What really is the ground reality? It is not that people want to copy uh, prescriptions, but it is because they have nowhere to go. Doctors are stressed; they are not available. You call physicians; they are either you know not there or very busy. So, what does one do? and in this context you also said that if a heart patient has some warning signs he should go to a nearby hospital now these on the ground really are not workable so what does one do in the current scenario the problem you described is real but then there are apps available there are calls uh, call centers available so you can get help in spite of that numerically so many people have got sick at the same time that all the healthcare advice systems the beds oxygen everything is under stress it is unprecedented misery that has been inflicted on people in that state to actually feel that you are helpless and you are you you don't have any port open to you that is a terrible situation it only makes that anxiety even worse you know as doctors we are actually very distressed inside not from the work so much as the as the fact that so many people are going through such tragedies so it is it's like somebody it, it, some doctors we are we were discussing it's like we are actually crying inside how grim is the situation and how rocky is the road ahead this is a very important point when the fir- when first covid 19 hit us in india we were there was a lot of wishful thinking we have been vaccinated with bcg when the summer comes the virus will die our own immunity is so strong because we are used to uh, not so hygienic conditions that we will be able to fight the virus better than the rest of the world of course all three things were wrong i mean were proved so wrong that we suffered as much as anybody else now numerically we suffered but our population is also huge so if you start looking at percentages we say oh we did better than the world that's not a, any consolation to the person who got affected and there are more people who probably never found out like a zero surveys are showing that a good 30 35% people have developed uh, antibodies that means they got infected they may have or may have not have recognized and they and if you are away from the mainstream into villages and all 
people may have died even we don't know so the point basically here is one that the ferocity is has proven us wrong that we are going to be better off than the rest of the world okay having accepted the fact what are the things that we can do so one was the public's role the other is the role of the healthcare sector that we know like we need to open up every bed we can every facility we can in the, inside the hospital to treat the sick but then you need large volumes of oxygen to treat those people who have reached a breaching point so oxygen supplies must be improved asap dr trihan you spoke about lots of apps being available but you know there are senior citizens some of them live alone and are not tech savvy don't you think a human help desk is the answer for at least that segment so you know this is where the ngos can play a huge role there are everywhere there are ngos and there are rwas and there are associations and even religious organizations who can activate this whole system of giving care to the people who otherwise cannot get care for themselves namely the elderly namely uneducated people who are in villages who don't understand how to fill a form that people who need vaccination where we can we can arrange like you know a lot of things have been done uh, like from vedanta we are going to the door to give the vaccine so we go to, we have organized camps in the rwas in the villages with our backup facilities available so that if somebody gets a reaction we can treat them on site and transport them to the hospital so many many things have happened but when you count it over such a large population it is still minuscule while on vaccination are there any do's and don'ts for a heart patient no not really that all heart patients can take the vaccine some of them are on blood thinners they must tell the their doctors that they are going for it if the medicine needs to be adjusted which is does not have to be adjusted most of the time and you tell the vaccinator that you are on blood thinners so they know now they have been trained that instead of rubbing they just have to put constant pressure for 3 minutes or so on the site of injection and then there is no risk of a hematoma and so these are simple things that need to be done now when you talk about vaccine let me tell you the vac- vaccine scene for everybody including heart patient see as you do around the world there is not enough vaccine to to vaccinate the whole population at one go so what it what was what was done in countries like us uk where vaccinated start the vaccination started before we did that they gave priority groups the most vulnerable should be protected first and it was the right idea india adopted it also now this first system was going quite well in the sense it was very orderly although many people who wanted it were not getting it but in the priority group people who wanted it got it and there was some hesitancy which is uh, which was also not very nice but anyway the question then came how to manage to open it up for everybody and allow private sector to do it which was welcome the idea is welcome but it has created huge chaos some people were said that like what what is going on is they say okay five states those, those hospitals who went and gave a good price to to the manufacturers they got vaccine the ones who were buying to like we have been offered in the black no we don't that has shifted the balance from a very orderly vaccination program to a very disorderly one where the people who can't afford so much will be deprived the people who can afford can will will get preference and that's the last thing you want to do in a country like india you do not want to add privilege at this time to anybody so we are requesting the government that please go back to the old system where we will pay the price whatever has been fixed for the private sector that's not a problem 
but the distributor distribution channels which were well established that it was distributed to the district and the district we we went and picked it up from the district making the payment right now with the free market in a sensitive time like this with the rare commodity your there is abuse going on right now as we speak do you think the government made a fatal mistake in reversing the earlier policy and what was the logic of doing it well i'm not privy to privy to the logic the idea was that let us open it up for everybody which is a good idea but its implementation has been uh, sort of done in a way which not understanding the ground real reality or maybe even understanding it and overlooking it the point is i don't know what the forces at play are so in short the government has messed it up yet again well you may call what what it is but i think there were must must be some forces at play which i have no i'm not privy to but my only request is please go back to the old system which was working so well and just do the differential pricing there's nothing wrong with that that is absolutely acceptable so i don't know what the pressures were under whose pressure this whole thing has been done this way but right now it's causing so much chaos and so much anxiety in people it's not right coming back to heart patients and covid how does a heart patient get through covid and how high is the risk loop as it were well it is increased risk it's a comorbidity which is one of the major comorbidities so you for at one point if you are vulnerable you should protect yourself even more there's no need to violate the principle of covid appropriate behavior and the second warning is that this virus has a r r factor two to three times that of the previous wave so you that means that your chances of getting infected are much more than it was the last time so that means you have to double up your precaution so we are saying now wear a mask even in your house because you don't know who's bringing it in what about medication should the same medication or the regular medication continue or do they need to be stepped up when a heart patient gets covid only if they have their symptoms change now somebody gets higher blood pressure than they had before so you may have to adjust the medicine if somebody is blood sugar has gone up so high or and they also may have heart disease or may or may not but you need to adjust the medications according to the findings if your heart rate goes up that's one of the most frequent thing that happens that you get fever and your heart rate goes up and you're a heart patient then you become more vulnerable for a heart attack then we at that moment we need to adjust the medicine so that's what i'm saying taking the cue that all of our people who do have heart disease have a already treating physician who knows them it is the duty of the of the treating physician to make themselves available to the patient because they are in the going through a very vulnerable period so this goes both ways from the patient and the doctor's point of view that this communication should become more intense more regular and should not be broken for any reason so in the case of a heart patient can the complications get very serious you know you can get a heart attack and lose your life that's how serious it can be so you should not miss it you must overcome it in the sense of go to the right facility if you happen to be near where you are being treated anyway like we get it every day uh, we get patients that we, it's our duty also to try to give, accommodate them and treat them because they are the most vulnerable at that time so it's okay for a heart patient to be at home and he doesn't have to rush to a hospital yes it's okay for them to be at home no question do not rush to the hospital because of the fact that there is no such thing as preventive care preventive care is at home constant monitoring is what is needed you know i have heard uh, icu facilities being set up at home how advisable how feasible <clears throat> is it and would you advise that people who can afford it 
can set up a icu uh, facility at home so it is a good concept dependent upon what is the state of the patient and how severe is the problem so marginal situations where people may not really need the icu but are not so well enough to be able to take care of yourself or need constant monitoring it's a good idea now again it comes back to the same thing what is the quality of care given at home because unless it is appropriate and it's not see what what happens because of the covid wave a lot of need has arisen and companies must be careful that do not take on more than they can handle and provide inferior service because then you are giving a false security to the person that we are taking care of you but your doctors and your nurses don't know how to take care of people so that's that's the caution to the providers and also for people who should not they should not be extending their stay at home thinking they have icu at home because it can't be replicated it can be halfway icu and i think that for elderly who it is always they feel more comfortable less anxiety less uh, if the family is around okay so care at home has its value but it should be calibrated that you don't exceed the limit and say the pressure is coming down i'll try to fix it here or in spite of the regular maneuvers the oxygen is not coming up and the patient is sinking you can't say that i am providing icu services or i have got icu services and that means that everything can be done at home no <clears throat> there are some things can be done to a limit dr trihan how does one go about setting up these icu facilities at home and how expensive is it you if you have the resources you can get a doctor to advise you to set it up it's not easy in the sense that you need a monitor you need the uh, the uh, oxygen facilities you need intravenous facilities so you can give intravenous drugs all those things are necessary but you also need the right personnel so it, that way it's better to contract it to one of these providers the service providers who have the methodology all worked out and they can give you the services so that is a better way of doing it rather than doing a jugaad at home because that can also mislead you into false security dr trihan we are in a messy situation no oxygen no beds the infrastructure practically crumbling who is to blame and where did we go wrong now two things you must know one this is an unprecedented situation nobody ever imagined that in this day and age a pandemic of this magnitude will come which will match the spanish flu pandemic which happened 100 years ago okay when it first hit pp kits were alien to us n95 masks were alien to us but we adapted very quickly and the country adapted very quickly we started manufacturing our own this is all this and we got the lockdown helped and by the time the lockdown was lifted we were fit and ready from the medical profession to take it on now that gave us some comfort and it's collective i i wouldn't say somebody like we if we failed we failed collectively because it happened people got the comfort that it's over and we can go and do what we want to do because they had been missing these congregations and socialization and all that and they threw caution to the wind and and started doing things the basic thing is individually each thing is to be blamed on one sector so individually if people threw caution to the wind they are they slipped i would you say blame because they did it in in ignorance well having big parties big weddings of 400 500 people is to blame maybe we should not have allowed it knowing that the virus was still around 
so we opened up too quickly thinking that we were over it that was a fallacy second thing is that should uh, elections be have taken place or should the kumbh have been allowed these are things beyond the comprehension of a of a individual to or a doctor to say you know what would have been the consequence if the elections were postponed i have no idea i can say if they if they were, were postponed of course that would have helped if the kumbh was organized in a different way of course it was it would have helped what the compulsions are that's a matter of state craft I, for us individuals it's very difficult to understand so i would say to answer your question who to blame i think it's a collective blame if there is such, such a word as blame you could, i would say that there is it was a mistake we all made and we are suffering for it we have a, we are paying a huge price for it so in that sense would you agree that the government was caught napping or became complacent warning signs did come but we all started saying very early when the numbers started rising that look this is happening now and it will go into large numbers so let's stop let's stop people didn't stop now the government should have come down on them yes maybe we should have stopped all travel and all that and say hey please take a pause here but i don't know this whole debate about uh, life and livelihood on one hand we say there has to be a balance that's correct and then the other says jaan hai to jahan hai so where do you find the balance that's the whole thing so dr trehan will there be a silver lining i'm sure we'll get over it but what price we will pay for it is the issue there's no point in saying you are to blame he is to blame that's not the issue today do the post mortem later right now you say all of us are in the in the deep end together let's find the shore quickly as fast as we can dr naresh trehan on that positive note let me thank you for your time and for answering all the questions my my honor